Today we can start with the naming values. It's often helpful to give the values in our programs names to help us keep track of things. If we ask a user for his slash her name, we want to store it for the later usage without asking for it again and again every time we need to do some computation with it. An example, pi equals 3.14. The name pi is connected to the value 3.14. From our experience, we can tell that the type of a variable pi is a decimal number. Yeah, we presume this will be a float number as we know some programming. Another example would be first name equals Alice, where first name is the name of a variable with the value Alice. We would say that the type of this variable is a word. In programming languages, this works similarly. These name assignments have their name, the value, and the type. Yes, this is a static type language, so we'll need to specify types. So variable declaration. Name is statically typed. Programming language means that the type of an assignment needs to be declared before using the value. In NIM, we also distinguish values that can change or mutate from those that can't. But more on this later. We can declare a variable, a mutable assignment, using the var keyword, just by stating its name and type. The value can be added later by using this syntax. So yeah, we specify var, give it some kind of name, colon, and we specify the type. So this is something that we'd see in TypeScript and Go. If we already know its value, we can declare a variable and give it a value immediately. Var, name, type, and value. Yeah, of course, those angular brackets are used to show something you can change. So name is not literally the word name. Nim also has type inference ability. The compiler can automatically detect the type of the name assignment from its value without explicitly stating the type. We'll look more into the various types in the next chapter. So we can assign a value without an explicit type like this. Okay, that makes sense. Var something equals something. And the compiler will be smart enough to figure out what type the value is. An example of this in Nim looks like this. Var a and so we declare a variable a of type int as an integer with no value explicitly set. So we know that we have integers available just as int. And variable b has a value of 7. This type is automatically detected as an integer. Perfect. The less work for us as programmers, the better. When assigning names, it is important to choose names that mean something for a program. Simply naming them A, B, C, and so forth will quickly become confusing. It's not possible to use spaces in a name, as that would split it in two. So, if the name you choose consists of more than one word, the usual way is to write it in a camel case. Yep, first lowercase, later words start with capital. Note, however, that nim is both case and underscore insensitive. Oh, meaning that hello world and hello world would be the same name. Exception to this is the first character, which is case sensitive. Names can also include both numbers and other UTF-8 characters. Even emojis, should you wish that. But keep in mind, you and possibly others will have to type them. That is interesting. So let's try it. I don't know if I worked with a language that's case insensitive before. So let's say that we declare a variable, it will be something. And we say something is hello, right? That should be a string. Echo something. Will that work? That works. That's so weird. So if I'll make it capital, now look how it changed the way it's displayed. So that will definitely not work. Undeclared identifier something. Okay. But if we'll just keep as and I don't know, add some random craziness. Ah. Without indentation. Okay, so it doesn't like try to underscores, but if I'll put A, nope. Okay, so it doesn't like underscores. Something, right? This is fine, but if I'll do underscore, now it doesn't mind. Still doesn't mind. It doesn't mind all those things. But if I'll put two next to each other, oh, that's where it goes. So no two underscores next to each other, but this, when the final save it, should still run. That is so weird. I guess it could make some typos work, but I can't imagine situations where that would be actual use case. Interesting, and they said that we can also declare variables with emojis. So let's type some emojis. I don't know. 
uh, laughing face equals and we just also do another laughing face and we don't have underscores save it and run it <laughs> that's a little bit crazy but the question is can i just do without character front oh no it's possible you can do weird stuff with that hello there and uh, wave will that work as well save it and let's run it there we go uh it works why not possibilities are endless i like it all right so include both numbers and other utf8 characters so i guess if you lie if you write in language that has weird characters like you know non ascii you can just do that huh all right so instead of typing var for each variable multiple variables not necessarily of the same type can be declared in the same var block and name blocks are part of code with the same indentation same number of spaces before the first character and the default indentation level is two spaces you will see such blocks everywhere in the program not only for assigning names so we basically have a block var two spaces and we can assume that it's for all okay it looks tidy i like it you just have a big header telling that okay now we're declaring things cool and this was the character yeah character string and this will be an integer and name tabs are not allowed as indentation you can set up your code editor to convert pressing tab to any number of spaces in vs code the default setting is to convert tab to four spaces this is easily overridden in settings okay sure we can check if our vs code ah look at that it wants four spaces and then using spaces two there we go let's continue as previously mentioned variables are mutable uh, an example, their value can change multiple times, but their type must stay the same as declared. Okay, so they're basically mutable. We declare a variable where variable means it's something that will change. And then we can assign however many times we want. But if we will try to assign a string of characters to an integer, it will just like, nope. If I'll try to copy it, yeah, let's see what the compiler errors look like. If we'll paste that. We already get the type mismatch, got string for hello, but expected int. That's nice and clear. If we'll save it and try to run it, the same thing. Which file, which location in the file, and just a clear error. I like it. No mysterious 30 line errors. Alrighty. Immutable assignment. Unlike variables declared with var keyword, two more types of assignment exist in NIM, whose value cannot change. One declared with the const keyword and the other declared with the let keyword. Okay, so we, we start with const. So that would be pretty straightforward. Const. The value of an immutable assignment declared with const keyword must be known at compile time before the program is run. Okay, that's that's pretty classic for programming languages. For example, we can declare the acceleration of gravity as constant g equals 9.81 or pi as constant pi 3.14. As we know their values in advance and these values will not change during the execution of our program that will work but when we'll try to assign it it'll be an error if instead we'll declare a variable h and create variable i where we try to use h we should get another error let's see what those errors look like so we'll see here 35 cannot be assigned to um what is that like three separate lines assigned to Oh, okay. 35 cannot be assigned to. I don't like that error. I guess you're getting good used to it. This is the same one we actually run it. 35 cannot be assigned to. Okay, so I guess it takes the value instead of saying that it's G cannot be assigned to, or like constant G cannot be assigned to. Um, That could be improved, I guess. Maybe there's some reason behind it. The other one was where we tried to use a variable that should be only runtime in... A constant so variable h is not evaluated at compile time it is variable and its value can change during the execution of a program consequently the value of constant i can't be known at compile time okay so let's see the error what we'll get here cannot evaluate at compile time h okay that points us exactly to h hey this is not compile time cool that's clear in some programming languages, it is a common practice to have the names of constants written in all caps. Ugh. Constants in NIM are written just like any other variable. Thank you. 
let. Yeah, because my opinion is that if we have constants as, you know, the special things of all caps, it feels like it would mean that, hey, this is this rare thing, we should use it rarely or declare it somewhere far away. But I presume you can declare, declare it anywhere, somewhere in the middle of the code. So why make it where it's a special thing that would suddenly make some people think like, oh, oh, oh I, I better avoid doing that because it just puts those all caps everywhere. It looks ugly and I know it, it's something special. I should use it rarely. I don't know. That, that's the feeling I had initially when I started programming where like, oh, 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 I need to leave constants for those special cases. Well, hey, whenever you know, just use it. All right, let's go to let. Immutable assignments declared with let don't need to be known at compile time. Their value can be set at any time during the execution of a program, but once it's set, their value cannot change. Oh, that's very nice. So when we say let j is 35, we try to resign it, we get an error. And we create a variable k, and we create an immutable variable <laughs> l, and we can use k, this should work, yeah, because this is the runtime, so by the time this is being executed, the k is known. Okay, that makes sense. So let's just see that this is the same, like, not very helping error as in the other case. Yeah, j cannot be assigned to. Okay, this is a little bit more helpful, we don't have that. 35 cannot be assigned to, we have j cannot be assigned to. Okay, that hints at something, because if we'll make it constant, right, we have... 35. So it pretends, I guess, the compiler or whatever it's running before the errors are being found. I guess compiler literally sees, okay, this is a constant. Let's just grab it and just paste it here. And we end up with this code. And if I'll do save, we have, yeah, 35 cannot be assigned to exactly the same thing. Okay, problem solved. <laughs> All right, now we know. Okay, in practice, you'll use let more frequently than const. Yeah, of course, because uh, in this case, const works like if you were writing your JavaScript or TypeScript, we're encouraged to use const every time you know that that value won't change because that, you know, speeds things up a little bit, makes sure that you won't mess things up. Uh, so, yep, so let is equivalent of what you would have in JavaScript. Constant is like totally because it's pre-compilation or like during compilation. This can be set in runtime. Well, you could use var for everything. Your default choice should be let. Use var only for the variables which will be modified. Yes, and in that case, the var is becoming special because this indicates the moment you see var, it's like, oh, 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 this thing will be modified at some point. I should pay attention to that. It's not just a little value that I'll I'll just save and use. This will be something that will be changing. So I really like it. Okay, time for another one which in this case is basic data types. Integers. As seen in the previous chapter, integers are numbers which are written without a fractional component and without a decimal point. For example, 32, negative 174, 0, uh, 10 million, so we can use underscores. Cool. Are all integers. Notice that we can use the underscore as a thousand separator to make larger numbers more readable. It is easier to see that we're talking about 10 million when it's written as this rather than this where you actually need to start squinting and one to three one to three and then oh we have extra zero so it's not million it's 10 million so they said that we can use it for thousands but i wonder if we can just place them wherever let's check that let uh, whatever i equal and we have this right this is fine it's happy just unhappy that we didn't use it. there we go Echo I. Perfect. It's been used. What if I'm gonna remove one zero? It's fine. It doesn't complain. I can run it, right? Yep, it runs. So I guess I could just do that if I wanted for some reason. Okay. So we can use it as a thousand separator or just any kind of separator. Cool. The usual mathematical operators, addition, plus, subtraction, hyphen, multiplication, asterisk, and division, forward slash, work as one would expect. The first three operations always produce integers, while dividing two integers always gives a floating point number. Okay, that makes sense. A number with a decimal point. As a result, even if two numbers can be divided without a remainder. All right, so if we're gonna basically divide two by two, we're gonna get 1.0. Okay. Integer division, division where the fractional part is discarded, can be achieved with the div operator. Okay, that makes sense. An operator mod, 
Let's use, uh, use if one is interested in the remainder as in modulus of an integer division. The result of these two operations is always an integer. So you have A and B, and we can basically add them, subtract, uh, multiply, divide, but it will be, a result will be a float with a fraction. We can divide, which will be int, we just discard the floating part, modulus, standard. Okay, cool. And exactly. So for normal slash, we'll get this result, while for the div operator, we'll just get this without the everything that's after, what do you call it, floating point? Okay, decimal, I don't know, I haven't studied math and English, so <laughs> I'm not sure. Alrighty, floating point numbers, or floats for short, are an approximate representation of real numbers. It's good that they're pointing that out here, as this is for new programmers. Yes, floats are approximate representation. They, they can have little glitches, hopefully not as much as in JavaScript, but they're approximate. That's, for example, why... When playing Minecraft, you have, if you go far enough, far away, f uh, very far away, uh, you get to what they call far lands, where things are getting wonky, and it's because that far away, game, the numbers become so large that we're starting to lose precision, and that's where glitches happen. That's why for many years in various games, you cannot have very large maps, because suddenly animations, you know, things were just glitching out, started shaking a little bit, and as further away you, you, you went from the center of the map, uh, the more glitches happened. So, for example, 2.73, negative 3.14, 5.0, or 4, and exponential 7 are floats. Notice that we can use scientific notation for large floats, where the number after e is the exponent. In this example, 4e7 is a notation representing 4 times 10 to the power of 7. So basically 4 and 7 zeros after it. All right. We can also use the four basic mathematical operations between two floats. Operators div and mod are not defined for floats. It makes sense. So we get all that. That's pretty straightforward. I don't think we need to, you know, look at an examples of that. Next, the precedence of mathematical operations is as one would expect. Multiplication and division have higher priority than addition and subtraction. Sure. So if we want to print that, first we'll do 3 times 4, which will give us 12, plus that 2, will be 14. There we go. And here, division first, so we get 2, 24 minus 2 will be 22. And of course, 0, 0.0, because we divide it here, so we got a 2.0, and I guess, because this is 2.0, and we subtract it from integer, everything just turns into floats, just to handle the possible case. Okay, hmm, let me try that. That would be interesting if it would just automatically round things up like that. And we can run it? We can. Okay, huh. I'm surprised that it actually automatically changes, you know, as we have a float here. Okay, okay. Wonder what the rules are for that. Converting floats and integers. Mathematical operations between variables of different numerical types are not possible in them. And they will produce an error. So we get 5 plus this, we get an error. And why didn't, get we, didn't we get an error here? Because it wasn't explicitly as that? Yeah, so if I will do 8.0 by 4, it still works. So if we'll go 23... Plus 3, that's fine, 3.0, that's not fine. But if we'll do divide by 2, what the hell? Why is it suddenly a mismatch? This is float, this is float, this is float. Huh, very interesting. I guess, guess the only explanation of it working like that here is a compiler did, it, did something to it. It's interesting. The values of variables need to be converted to the same type. Conversion is straightforward. To convert to an integer, we use the int function, and to convert a float, the float function is used. Okay, so you can just wrap the whole thing in float and int, similar to JavaScript. Okay, that makes sense. I want to try something that I saw somewhere. So let's grab this code, and it should be happy. This is our integer, this is our float, and we can convert an integer to float, and that will, I guess, print it out with a float? Yeah, it printed out a float. Well, if we get a float and we turn it to integer, it will just discard everything that's not a whole number. 
We can add those together now because this turns E into float. And we have that. And or we can do, do everything with floats. I want to try something because in few places I saw that you can actually do E dot float F dot int. Haha. <laughs> there we go. So E dot F float plus F dot int. Save and run. Oh, I like how to have that option. I, I don't know. For me, whenever you don't have like million parentheses, it's just more readable. I guess. I don't know. For me, I like this approach where you can convert just by doing dot something dot something. When using the int function to convert a float to integer, no rounding will be performed. Exactly. The number simply drops any decimals. To perform rounding, we must call another function. But for that, we must know a bit more about how to use them. All right, let's move on from numbers to characters. The car type is used for car as char. I never know how to read it. Char? Car? Because you say character, but you don't want to say car. It has H in there. Char. <laughs> Not character. The char type is used for presenting a single ASCII character. Okay, that's I guess important. So this is not Unicode, this is simply ASCII. So we are limited. Okay, characters are written between two single ticks. Mm -hmm. Instead of uh, double quotes. Char characters can be letters, symbols or single digits. Multiple digits or multiple letters produce an error. Okay, so we have let and bam. Yeah, we just declare different things. But yeah, this won't work because it should be a single character. Not the, this is two characters. This is two characters as well. Yeah. Okay. Strings. Strings can be described as a series of characters. Their content is written between two double quotes. We might think of strings as words, but they can contain more than one word. Some symbols or digits. Mm -hmm. So we can basically do whichever we want. This will be an empty string. Yep, empty string. This will be just uh, two digits, three and two. It's not a number. Mm -hmm. It's a double quotes making the string. And exclamation mark, mark is just, even though it's only one character, it's not a char because it is enclosed inside of double quotes. Okay. Special characters. If we try to print the following string. Yep, even syntax highlighting shows that this will be a new line and this will be a tab. The result will be... Bam, some, and we don't have n because that's slash n, <laughs> and tips. Okay, this is because there are several characters which have a special meaning. They are used by pre prepending the escape character backward slash to them. Uh, backward slash n is a new line character, backward slash t is a tab character, and two backslashes is since the first backslash is used as the escape character. So this basically signifies that, hey, we are going to type in some special character. And then it comes to this, oh, oh, the special character is this. And there we go. If we wanted to print above example, and it was written, we have two possibilities. Use double slash instead of slash to print backslashes. Like here, we basically need to make double backslashes every time we actually want to type a backslash. Or use raw strings which have syntax of those double quotes just with R in front of it. And it needs to be immediately before the first quote, no spaces, no shenanigans. In which there are no escape characters and no special meanings. Everything is printed as is. All right, that's simple. I like that there's no crazy, you know, like different languages have maybe backticks or some ads and everything. R for raw and that's it. I like it. There are more special characters than ones listed above, and they are all found in the manual. Okay, I presume they're all classic. No frills, no thrills. Uh, okay, string concatenation. Uh, I'm going to be curious about that because I find many languages just doing weird stuff. Like, why are you doing that? Why are you making it more difficult? I mean, there are reasons for it, but I hope this is not one of those languages. And string, uh, strings and nim are mutable. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, I like it, meaning their content can, can change. So for me, what it means is like, okay, every time I'm adding something to a string, you know, like add this and that and that and that, that means that I'm not doing something that will happen. For example, like in C-sharp, we're copying the whole thing and 
adding to it like you know okay we had a string of length of 30 characters we want to add three characters we need to now declare a new spot in memory that is 23 characters long and copy the first string there and fill the rest with whatever we wanted to add you know like suddenly you need to do a lot of copy here you don't have to just with the add function we can add append either another string or a character to an existing string awesome if we don't want to change the original string, we can also concatenate as in join together strings with the ampersand operator. This returns a new string. Okay, so we have we have both options. We don't need to we can add to the string or concatenate them together. So we have P as ABC, Q as XY, and R as Z. If we do P dot add DEF, that means that the P will now be A B C D E F. So from now, the P will be this. So P is now A, B, C, D, E, F. Perfect. And they say if we plan to modify strings, they should be declared as var. As var. That's good to know too. Adding another string modifies the existing P in place, changing its value. Then we have Q.addR. So we took the Q, which is XY, and we added a character. See, that's a character, not a string. And now Q is now and it should be X, Y, Z. We can also add character to a string. Yep, X, Y, Z. Okay, an echo, concat, P, and Q. Okay, this is nice and readable. I like it. I guess initially I will, I will be confusing it with like bitwise and from many other languages, but yeah, I like it. It's simple, quick. If I'll do that with P and Q, so that would just concatenate them won't change them, so it should be A, B, C, D, E, F, X, Y, Z. So let's see, concat, yep, we ha we've got the whole thing. And if we print P or Q after that, we still see that they haven't changed. Okay, concatenating two strings produces a new string without modifying the original strings. Awesome. Okay, I really like that implementation. So we saw that uh, we can create a string simply by saying var hello equals hello world, right? Echo hello. So this is real simple. We do that and we have hello world. But earlier we tried to put emoji here. So if we put emoji, right? Save it and we run it, it works with the emoji. So I guess because these are just characters, the emoji is several characters long because uh, Unicode was designed basically to work where each of those emojis and special characters can be made, you know, with special... First, you have special characters that denote that, hey, we're, we're putting a Unicode character here, and then others specify its value, and therefore we can, you know, have uh, emojis. It's just several characters. That's simple enough. Uh, no craziness here, but I guess keeps it close enough to... to how things work in C and C++ by being just ASCII and therefore, you know, we can easily compile it to something that runs fast. Continuing, we now can go through Boolean values. A Boolean or just bool data type can only have two values, true or false. So unlike Python, even though it all looks like Python, true and false are with lowercase first letters. Okay. Booleans are usually used for control flow, and they are often a result of relation operators. Okay. The usual naming convention for Boolean variables is to write them as a simple yes-no, as in true-false questions. Is empty. Is finished. Is moving. Awesome. I am so happy that in this introduction tutorial they are adding this is empty is something. I find it really frustrating where somebody declares a variable finished. Just by having this is in front, you are explicitly, explicitly saying that it will be yes, no. And it helps with readability so much. The moment you say is, okay, that's gonna be a boolean. Don't put random b in front of it for boolean. Just do is finished, is empty, or if you have a single boolean value that is referring to something, you know, we can do var is finished and say it false, or var are finished. And it still signifies that, okay, this will be just yes or no, because are finished or are not finished. That's the only choice. But maybe 
you know, in the context makes sense. So sometimes you might write an application that deploys several workers or something, and you're writing some code that waits for them, and you have uh, a while loop or something, and you need to have a variable that you check if everything finished. So you could do is finished, but maybe you want to be a little bit more aware in your context, you think it's better to just use plural, you use are finished, and it'll be still very readable. And it's just three characters, just make it so much easier to read. So very happy to see that here. Relational operators, Re relational operators test the relation between two entities, which must be comparable. To comp compare two values are the same equals equals as in two equal signs is used. Do not confuse it with single equals, which is used for assignment. Okay, so this is classic. I presume there is no triple equals from JavaScript here. Although, as I was peeking through some other examples, <laughs> in Nim you can actually declare your own operators. Like, you don't need to just replace the existing ones, you can just make your own. And you can make quadruple equals if you want to do to, to something crazy. Nothing is stopping you. You can make five equals as an operator for some crazy comparison and it will let you. <laughs> so that's awesome and cruel as well too. So here are the, all the relational operators defined for integers. Okay, so we have two integers, g and h, and is greater than here. Is g is smaller than h. g is equal to h. g is not equal to h. g is greater than or equal. Mm -hmm. And it's smaller or equal. Okay, all the classic ones are here. And just re for each one of them returns either true or false. Awesome. We can also compare characters and strings. So we have three characters, A, D, and Z. I is smaller than J. I is A, J is D. So I presume this is based on the numerical representation of ASCII character, which is from 0 to 255. So... A is in front of D, so yes, that would be true. Let's see, I less than K. I is smaller than K. I'd say also true. Uh, in this case, A is before Z, and also Z is after, or wait, and ask you what comes first. Uppercase letters become lowercase, become before lowercase letters. Yeah. Oh, so uppercase are before. Okay, so in this case, it will be false because K, even though it's Z, it's capital Z, is before A. Okay, cool. Simple enough. Uh, just a simple explanation. Uh, you can imagine that uh, as in ASCII, you have, you know, like, for each value, whatever, 6 and whatnot, this is, I don't know, a space. It's not really that. This will be A. This would be B. And number three is C, something like that. Uh, I remember that number 13, for example, is the new line character. So basically, those characters are defined as something, something, something. And then you have A, B, C, D, E, and uh, ending with Z, uh, X, Y, Z. And then suddenly it switches to A, B, C, D, E, and goes on, and X, Y, Z. And then, for example, goes through numbers, then some different symbols, whatever, until it fills up all the 255 characters. That's a quick explanation. Okay, so let's move on to comparing strings. We have four of them declared here. Echo, M is less than N. So is AXYB less than AXYZ? I say yes, because A's are exactly the same. The uh, X's are the same, Y's are the same, and then we have B, lowercase b and lowercase z. Then lowercase will be before it, therefore M will be smaller. It's number two. String comparison works character by character, exactly. First three characters are the same, and the character B is smaller than character Z. Exactly. So let's go to another one. N is less than O. N less than O. So in the first character, instantly we have that the N, the A is less than B, so N will be smaller. So number three. String length doesn't matter for comparison if their characters are not identical. Okay, big if, if their characters are not identical. So I guess we're going to the last one. O is less than P. So we have O as BA and P, which is BA with space. So now we get to the situation where they have the same letters, at least the beginnings, but they're not the same length. So these are equal, these are equal. And suddenly we have no more here and something here. So I presume 
that nothing will be less than something. So I would presume that this will be true. Shorter string is smaller than a longer one. Exactly. At least when they both start exactly the same. Cool. Logical operators. Logical operators are used to test the truthiness of an expression consisting of one or more Boolean values. Logical and returns true. Only if both members are true. Yep. Or returns true if there's at least one, at least one member which is true. Okay. Logical XOR returns true if one member is true but the other is not. So it's basically if both of them are true or both of them are false, this will return false. It will return true only if, if just one of them is true and the other one is not. Logical NOT negates the truthiness of this member, changing true to false and vice versa. It's the only logical operator that takes just one operand, as in you can just say not and something. It's not sandwiched between two things. So let's see. T and T as true and true, that will give us true. Because true and true is true. Uh, true and false will give us false because it, both of them are not true. And if we do false and false, it will give us false because and is happy only if both things are true. So this is like, you know, the basics, basics of programming and basically logic. Uh, then we have or true or true. Well, either one of them is true, so yeah, that's true. True or false. At least one of them is true, therefore it will return true. False or false. Both of them are false, therefore it's there's no truth anywhere, so it will be false. Then we have X or. So that's the funny one and used rarely uh, because I think the big problem with it is that it is rarely accessible as that simple operand. It, 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 I like it because you can just type XOR. XOR and uh, air done. So true X or true. This will return false because this wants one of them to be true while the other one to be false. Here both are true, so it will be it will return false. Here we have one true and one false. Therefore, it will be happy. There's this, you know, two are different. So basically we get turn true here. False, X or false. This will return false because you know, they're both the same. So X or returns true only if both sides are different. And then we have not, of course, not true will be false and not false will be true. Okay. There we have confirmation of that. Yep, all makes sense. Relational and logical operators can be combined together to form more complex expressions. For example, here we have the parentheses. So first we have a like, evaluate 5 is less than 7, so that will be true. This whole thing will be replaced with true. And we have this whole thing where we, I guess, evaluate that, which will be 20 is equal to 32 minus 12. It will be again 20, so 12 equals 20. That's true. So we have true and true, and therefore the whole thing will become true. Yeah, and I'm explaining basically the same process here. So at the end, we get the final result of true. Awesome. Recap, this was the longest chapter in this tutorial and we covered a lot of ground. Take your time or go through each data type and experiment with what you can do with each of them. Types might seem like a restriction at first, but they allow the NIM compiler to both make your code faster and to make sure you're not doing something wrong by accident. This is especially beneficial in large code bases. I very much agree with that. Now you know the basic data types and several operations on them which should be enough to do some simple calculations in him. Test your knowledge by doing the following exercises. Okay, so we'll be doing exercises, that's fun. Exercise number one, create an immutable variable containing your age in years. Print your age in days. Okay, one year is 365 days. So let's do that, we assume that it's 365. So we say that okay, they want variable with var, immutable variable. Okay, so we do let age and we say it's 32. And that'll be an integer. And then we want to echo it. Let's do print it out. So it's our age times 365 days, right? 365, yes. So we print that and I lived 11,680 days. It doesn't feel like I lived that many days. <laughs> I should have more practice in getting up in the morning, I guess. All right, that was exercise number one. Check if your age is divisible by three. Three. 
And as a hint, use mod as modules. All right, that'll be simple. We can do, hey, uh, let is divisible by three. And we'll decide that uh, is my age as in days? No, just age and years, I presume. So in years, so let's do age, right? And we do mod three, so modules three. So what it will do, it will basically this will take the age divided by three and returns the remainder of that division. <clears throat> so if we had zero mod three, that will be equal to because there's no remainder. Then we can do one mod three will return one because we can't really divide it by three yet. We have reminder one, two will be two. And when we get three mod three, we can divide it. We divide it. We got one three inside three and nothing left. So again, we got zero. Four will be uh one and it goes on with two zero one two zero one two zero one two zero so basically if you want to check if something is divisible by some number you get take that mat number mod whatever is divis divisible by and you check if it's if it, if it returns a reminder of zero so age mod three equals zero and i presume that equals i mean this is the calculation operation so that should be it yeah it doesn't make sense to be something else and already, nymph compiler figured out, okay, this means that this will be a bull. So let's do echo and we do age of, and we print at age, oh, that's those comma, I recall, comma, age, comma, is age of bam, 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 divisible by three, question mark. And we get the answer of is divisible by three. And when we run it, an answer, it's not divisible. The uh, next year will be. <laughs> Alrighty, let's continue. Create an immutable variable containing your height in centimeters. Okay, print your height in inches. One inch is 2.45 centimeters. Okay, that's a simple task. So we can add, again, immutable. So we let height in, in inches. Wait, I need to do it in centimeters. Height centimeters. And we'll set it will be the 180. So they don't say if it should be a float or not. If we need to print it out in inches, we can print it out as full inches or as something with a decimal. So let's go with full inches for now. So we have an uh, integer of 180 and let's do let height uh, inches. And that will be the if one inch is 2.54 centimeters, so we basically need to get eight centimeters divided by 2.54. That's unhappy because this is flow while this isn't. So let's just go simple ways. There we go. All divided. Both will be, this is flow 64 while this one is float. Okay, that's interesting. I guess we have like a generic assumed one and then not assumed. Oh, look at that. This is 64. This is 32. Or I can do float. And it will be just float. That's interesting. Hmm. Okay, so let's echo my, uh, my height in inches is. And we can print it out here. It will be height inches. Save it. Let's run it. And therefore, I'm 70.86. But if I wanted to do it just in as an integer, let's say round it down, it will be integer of that. And let's round it again. And we have that my height in inches, it's 70. 70 inches tall. Uh, it's probably closer to something like that. So let's save it and run it again to light a little bit less. 68 inches. Sure, why not? Okay, what is next? Pipe has 3 8 inch diameter. Express the diameter in centimeters. Okay, three eighths of an inch to centimeters. So let's get that. So pipe is let pipe diameter is three divided by eight. Okay, that will be a float. And let pipe diameter centimeters. So we take that pipe diameter, and this time we convert from inches to centimeters times 2.54. Okay, so we could go fancy and go here and say, hey, we have a constant a centimeter to inches. Uh, sorry, inch to centimeters. And that will be 2.54. So if we don't want to type that same value everywhere, or I don't know, at some point, 
something in the world we recalculated. We can just paste it here and we can paste it here. And there we go. So echo pipe diameter in centimeters is and we do pipe diameter cm save run there we go it's 0 0.9525 centimeter so uh nine and a half millimeter okay uh what is next create an immutable variable containing your first name and another one containing your last name make a variable full name by concatenating the previous two values don't forget to put a white space in between Print your full name. Okay, let's go. Uh, they want it to be immutable variables again. Let first name, this will be Ben. Let last name, Rudek. And we need to do let full name, and that will be first name. And, and we concatenate uh, ampersand. We make sure to add a space, ampersand, and last name. Okay, so we add all those together, and we do echo uh, mine name is and we put full name save run there we go it's here so i wonder if we can mix strings with characters here if i'll just concatenate a character run it works thank you i believe i found some other programs where it's like oh you can't concatenate a string with a character what is next next we have alice earns 400 dollars every 15 days Bob earns 3.14 per hour and works 8 hours a day, 7 days a week. After 30 days, has Alice earned more than Bob? Okay, sure. So let's copy it here and let's just make some room. So our task is, what was it? Something like this? Yes. And we can just paste it here and divide it so that we can have it displayed nicely. So we have that statement. We have next statement after 30 days so we care about 30 days so in this case 30 this is divided by divisible by 15 so i guess we just do that so let's do just something like let alice per day okay will be 400 dollars divided by 15 days okay that's simple now i will keep things as floats then <clears throat> let bob per day okay we know that he works seven days a week, so we don't need to subtract and skip any days. It's, they kept it simple. So Bob per day is basically eight hours a day times 3.14. And right now this will be happy. I'll just do that just so it's happier. We don't have to, okay? It makes it float anyway. Cool. So we basically do, I and mean, we can do 30 days, but it doesn't matter because all it comes down to is we're Per hour so we can just do sure let uh, alice after 30 days do alice per day times 30 let bob after 30 days equals bob per day times 30 you know we did both of them times 30 so it doesn't matter matter on mathematical way but whatever so echo uh, echo and let's do alice earned more than bob and we'll say alice after 30 days is more than bob after 30 days and let's see what we get yeah let's also do the other less and we just do that they want us to just as alice more earned more than bob okay so we just need that one earn more than bob we'll say true or false let's run it and we have alice earned more than bob true cool we finished our first set all right, so this apparently was the longest chapter. So yeah, that was a long time. It took me, uh, how long am I streaming? Hour and 20 minutes, wow.